uh, cloning. So there are situations, like I said, where either you have to, or it's actually a better decision to clone it. So some of the basic tips that I've been taught by guys who do this all the time, who are far smarter at this stuff than I am, these are still useful tips. I do not like to use the cloning tools built-in power supply. So like the T-Ninja box that Top Don makes has its own power supply it'll provide to the module. I hate it. I don't use it. I like to use a benchtop power supply with a splitter and do all the power and ground feeds from that because I can regulate the voltage and I can control the amperage. That way if I have a module that's really effed up and is like trying to pull 10 amps or something insane, the, the, pro, the, the charger or power supply will be like, no, not doing that. And that's good because then I know right then and there there's probably something going on, right? Because if it's on the bench and there's nothing connected to it, it's a pretty good bet it shouldn't be pulling a ton of amperage, right? I mean, what's, what's the most you've ever seen on a bench? Yeah, it's very, very low, right? So <laughs> one and a half amps, that's not much. So if we have something astronomical, the power supply is going to alert us to that too. So um, wired connections. If you're doing a lot of cloning, you're going to find if you have lots of little connectors that you're sliding onto pins, what happens if we depin and repin connectors all the time? We lose pin tension. So you have to be aware of this. You may want to, the T-Ninja box, for instance, comes with a bunch of awesome leads, but guess what? I've cloned a bunch of modules with it now, and uh, the pin tension's not so good anymore. So either you need to replace them, or you need to be able to repair them. And it doesn't matter which. I will say if you find yourself doing a large volume of a specific module, make a bench harness or buy a bench harness, because that will make your life easier. And that connector is not going to have the same fatigue and wear issues that the simple little slide-on ones do, right? That's just the reality. Um, making sure your internet connection is good. So depending on the cloning tool, some of the cloning tools require you have full internet access. Remember, some of the servers where those files live or the stuff's happening on the back end are not in America. So you want to make sure you know if your ISP is blocking that traffic. And that is a factor on some of the top-down stuff because some of the ISPs try to hard block all the stuff that happens on the back end. So remember that. You might need to use a VPN in certain circumstances. Just know that. Uh, if you don't know about that or you've never done that, do some research. It is something you'll have to do. They have added that in the library section of all the top-down tools. You can input your own VPN information now. So if you have a VPN you want to use, you can put that into the tool and there you go. Now you can easily do that. Um, reading the data from the module. Doesn't matter what data we're reading from the module. I was taught by Pedro De La Torre, very, very, very experienced module cloning guy, extremely smart. All the module guys in here will attest he's top of the line. He told me repeatedly, he said, if you're going to read crap off the module, you better read it at least two times, if not three, and you want to compare the data from the files to make sure you didn't read it corrupt. Because if you read corrupt data and then you write corrupt data, guess what you did? You just made your life hell. Not good, right? And that is always a concern. Um, like a thing. It's a good idea if when you do a cloning, you use a special break of both mm -hmm. for plug and play and plug it to the, to the, to the devices and you can use the... Absolutely. I use the GoDiag GT100 is usually pretty... Exactly. The, the breakout boxes cannot be oversold how valuable it is. Um, PC-based hex editor, there's times where you want to look at the data in the file. That's another thing that can be useful. Um, the top-down stuff is designed to really not make you have to go do that, and I'll show you the walkthrough here. Uh, making sure your tool's updated. Good God, do you know how many support calls I take where people, I log into the tool and there's 50 updates waiting, and I'm like, come on, man. you got to be kidding me. They're always making these tools better. You have to upgrade them. And just please, for God's sake, check your tools regularly. So here's an example of a power supply I use. It's a bench supply. This one's pretty straightforward. It's got a simple power ground and earth. And then basically, I just ordered a splitter that had an unshrouded BNC that'll plug into here. And I can split off of this and connect all the pins on the module. And you, can, you could make those if you wanted to. You could order those online. AES Wave sells them or they'll custom make them. I'm waiting on a quote for what they charge me. That one, the way it is, is only like 24 bucks or something stupid cheap. So I can't imagine when I get the quote back, it's going to be anything astronomical. I even want them to make me a red one and a black one because I'm dumb and I'd like to have them color coordinated, you know. Uh, so then, let's just look at a couple. We're going to do one example where we'll walk through what the process looks like. 
So if you have a Smarter Max and you haven't updated it yet, plug it into the wall via Ethernet. They updated the MDCI and you have a new UI and a lot better functionality on the JBox. It didn't work on Chrysler for a long time. And guess what? It works on Chrysler now. Had a buddy message me the other day. He goes, yeah, I just plugged into Ytech and it works. I said, what? It hasn't worked on Chrysler forever. Wait, now it's working on Chrysler? Well, that's good news. I like good news. Thanks. <laughs> and I, I mean, there's no way I can retest everything all the time. And I don't get cars of every brand every day all the time. So I count on people to tell me. So again, you get stuff like that, you know, message me. I like to know. Um, but we want to make sure the other thing we need to do when we're using, and this is true of any tool, but very to, true of any specific tool like this, connections, connections, connections. We have to make sure when we are connected on this tool, this goes USB and it shows right on the dongle, USB, directly to the tool. Why? Because if we're reading module data, we want a hardline connection. That reduces the chance of corruption or failure in the process of reading or writing the data. Now, I'll also tell you, I've accidentally had the, mod or the, uh, the dongle before they did the update on it. There were times where I'd plug in the USB cable and it would light up USB and Bluetooth, and I didn't notice. And guess what happened? I tried to read the data and it kept failing. And I'm like, what the hell? Why is it not reading the data? I thought there was something wrong with the tool. And this was one of the only times where engineering got back to me and said, did you do X? And I was like, I'm going to punch you in the face because that's dumb. <laughs> no, this time they were actually like, hey, there's an issue sometimes with these and it'll do this. And I was like, oh, shit. So I looked at the screen and I went, yep, sure enough, Bluetooth and USB were simultaneously lit up. Unplugged it plugged it back in, restarted the tool, it went USB only, read the file, no problem, done. And I'm like, oh my God, if only I'd been paying attention. But again, it's all these stupid details that can screw you. So let's go through, here's just a little bit of the more information. The T Ninja box does a lot more than just cloning. It does keys on Euro cars and you can do like all keys lost on VW Audi stuff, which is pretty cool. Uh, quite a wide variety of other things. So for its price, it's pretty good. And, this isn't meant to be sales, but I know a lot of people use it and we get a lot of questions about how to do stuff. And I wanted you to know what it can do. So it does actually have a lot of coverage for transmission cloning. Now remember, that's one of the use cases where I think it's actually a good idea to do it in a lot of cases. Not all, but a good idea in a lot of cases. Cloning a large number of the VW Audi transmissions is possible, including a pretty good large number of the uh, dual clutch transmissions. So you'll find it really useful there. It also does a lot of engine control modules, and that is one situation where security, there's a lot of security BS to go through on ECM, so I do get why guys will clone those sometimes. That wouldn't be my first choice, but it definitely would be on the table. So that's just for your reference. That gets updated all the time, so it'll be that plus more. This is the most recent version of VW Audi. This was taken literally a couple days ago, but each time they update it, they'll add more stuff. Uh, so here's an example. So we're going to clone a module from a 12, and yes, this is an ECM, so I'm doing something that is largely probably not necessary. So here's how you access it. Go to the module screen, just like you're going to clone or you're going to scan the vehicle, and guess where we go? We're going to go right up to special functions, anti-theft function, which makes sense, right? We're cloning stuff. Four and above a mobilizer, second and third. Remember when I said four started? Like 06-ish? Okay, so it's a four and above, right? What are we doing? Engine module replacement. Straightforward. Platform mode or vehicle mode? Platform mode. That's on the bench, and that's what I'm doing. And you have all these for reference. So then it tells you to connect everything, of course. And they tell you to plug a power supply into here, into the Y cable. This is the other reason why I prefer to use my own power supply to the module because the little tiny power supply that they give you with it is uh, debatable whether or, enough it's an, whether or not it's enough to run the T-Ninja box, the dongle, it's, it's trying to run everything. I'm a little bit skeptical. It's only, I think it's only a three amp power supply and that's cutting her a little close maybe. I'd rather have more, more opportunity to not have a problem. <laughs> so then we're gonna go to the wiring diagram. Basically, it's gonna tell you how to connect it, do all the pins. It's numbered cabling, it's stupid easy. So for the cloning stuff where it is pretty cut and dry and simplistic, the T-Ninja box does a good job. There's lots of deep dark holes that our modules are very convoluted to clone that I'm not ever gonna bother with because I'm like, F that. The amount of work I'd have to learn all that information in order to be able to get to serious XM calling, really, 
Um, I should have just answered and said, go away, right? Um, but the amount of information you have to learn to get to be able to do them correctly on some of the vehicle applications, yeah, you need multiple classes to get to that and a lot of experience. So the beauty of using a tool like the T-Ninja Box is they keep it pretty tight and narrow. It's stuff that the tool will walk you, well, more or less walk you through it, and it's pretty easy to do it, and they're gonna not do the stuff that gets usually too complicated because, hey, the tool is gonna get, they'd have to do a lot more with the tool engineering-wise to make it do that other stuff. So they're only gonna put stuff on the tool that isn't as bad or difficult. Like GM Global A modules, some of them are stupid easy to clone, right? Well, of course engineering's gonna put them on there because they don't have to work super hard to do it. It's easy for them. And also that means it's going to be easier for you. So good and bad, right? So then it gives us the pinout and it tells us all the numbered connectors to use. And yeah, the cable they give you is numbered, so it's pretty easy. Put the numbers where they go, that ain't that hard. The one exception would be the red and the black cables or the ones where they tell you it's power or ground, that's where I would bypass those from the T-Ninja box and I would run my own power supply. That's it, that's the difference. That's just my editorializing. It's really important that you follow the wiring diagram on the tool. Yes. Not the wiring diagram out of all the other Mitchell yes. stuff because there are pins that they use for cloning that are not used. Uh, to talk to the chipset, basically. Yes, he's correct. You have to, you have to rely on that. And that, it's, some of it can be Google searching too. Like if you're questioning whether or not the wiring diagram is correct, you can look up ME 17.2.2 wiring diagram or pinout. In a lot of cases, like OBD 365 is a website where they oftentimes tell you which pins to connect to. So yeah, this is, an, again, there's some self-education and going to classes and things like that where you learn a lot more, but it's all about that adaptive problem-solving mindset that will help you get to it. And believe me, if that's not how you do things, don't get into cloning. It will, <laughs> it will not go well, unless you do the really straightforward stuff that the tools can essentially walk you through. So we're gonna do, Read chip ID, this is basically, it's trying to talk to the chip. It's trying to say, hey, hello, I need to know your information. If it does this and you get the chip ID, your connections are good and you're gonna be okay. If it fails here, do it two or three times because sometimes I've had it fail the initial and make sure you recheck your connections. If it still fails, you might have a bad module. If it doesn't fail after that and it does go through, you're gonna be good. But that basically you initiate the connection. Now we're gonna back up the data and we're gonna back up the data, right? But remember, we're gonna do it two or three times for each of those two file styles on this ECM. Then, we're gonna go back to the main screen, and this is a place where a lot of people didn't know this existed. And this is a more recent addition to the tool, so thank God they added it, because most of these guys who do the cloning were like, where the hell is the file comparator? You wanna be able to compare the data from file A and file B to make sure that when I read it twice, what I read was identical both times, right? Well, guess what, they fixed that. They put it back in the tool now. So we go into services and IMMO prog. We go, oh, it tells us to connect everything. We're already connected. Data comparison. Now we have multiple different files. We load them in and we hit the compare button. Uh-oh, we might have had a corrupted read. So I'd go back and reread whatever that file was another time and then compare all three versions and whichever two are the same, I'm pretty confident. And if I want to go overkill, I'll go four or five and you know, we'll play the odds, right? But that's still something you want to do. So then, oh look, I actually got one that was the same, right? And yeah, I did this on purpose, so just wanted to demonstrate. So then, now I'm gonna go back into the VW menu. So I'm gonna go all the way back out to the main screen, go right back into the scan function, like I'm gonna talk to it, go back in through special functions, anti-theft, engine control module, go all the way back in, and then I'm gonna go here, and I'm gonna decrypt the flash and EEPROM data. That's important, we need to do that. Now someone asked me, would you decrypt both? Yeah, I'd decrypt both the donor module and the original module data. It's a good idea, you need to do that. Correct me if I'm wrong, obviously. <laughs> but I always do, that's just the way I've done it. So then, it's gonna, when, it, when it decrypts it, it spits out a screen like this, and I always take a screenshot of this because this is information you may need later. CS number, pin number, I don't remember what the Mac is for off the top of my head. I, I can't remember what I used it for last. But anyway, anytime the tool gives you information, it's a good idea to immortalize it. It's just like a pre-scan. You know, record that crap. Now, if you're on the Macs, boom, screenshot button. Love it. So easy. I don't have to try. I don't have to pull my phone out. Boop, got it. Now, I still take a picture with my phone because, again, overkill, double backup. Okay? So now it's going to generate files for us. 
and it's going to say, hey, look, we're going to make an EEPROM file that's going to be available for the cloning. Everything's decrypted. Everything's good. This is what you have to make the tool do. Then it's going to do the same thing for the flash, if I remember correctly. Maybe it does it in one shot or two steps. I can't recall. But then, after we have those decrypted files, we're going to go into the cloning menu. Now, we have to load all the files. So the language is slightly confusing. Donor module, so this is the used module we got. This is the original module, right? Because that's the identity we want to clone into the used module. We're going to load the related files that have been decrypted for both Flash and EEPROM data. Then we're going to hit cloning. And now the tool on the back end is going to make all the stuff work like it's supposed to, right? It's going to make up all the correct data, substitute what it needs to, do everything that we need so we have the proper formatted and data content file that has all the anti-theft data we need, because that's really what we care about in this case, right? All the anti-theft data is what has to transfer for the car to not go, hey, F you, you put that in my, in my vehicle and now I'm angry, right? We want it to think the module we just put back in is exactly the same module we disconnected. So it has to mesh all that information. It does that, then it spits out the information in two files. It gives you flash first, then it gives you EEPROM. And you name them whatever you want as long as you remember what the hell they are. That's it. <laughs> and maybe take a picture with your phone just to cover your ass. Now you've got your two files saved. Now we're going to say, some guys say they like to write the flash data first. Some guys say they write the EEPROM data first. Do you have a preference on that? No, no not really? Yeah, I, I haven't heard any good rationale why one than the other, but I just go in the order the tool gives me because I'm like, well, whatever. Maybe they had a reason. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. So I go through. We're going to go restore the EEPROM data. Now the file we're loading there is the decrypted cloned file that we named, and you saw I named it cloned, so it's easy for me to remember. That's the file I want, right? Then I'm, going to, then I'm going to write that file. Then it's going to say successful or failure. Then I'm going to come back out to this menu and hit restore flash data, and I'm going to do the same thing. Use the decrypted cloned file and write it to the module. You'll get the menu like this. It'll say it's restoring. The flash takes significantly longer to write than the EEPROM, so just keep that in mind. EEPROM can be very quick. Flash can take a while. Also, if you're a dumbass and it's trying to do it over Bluetooth, it takes a really long while, which is why another reason you want a hard line connection. But anyway, you'll get a message like this if it's successful. There's your module after it was all good. I was able to clone it, and it was successful, and I was able to install it, and it was happy. So that